Hi everybody, this is Arkady Frechtman, and a personal injury trial attorney here in New York. And welcome to Last Week Tonight, where we answer your questions and we talk about your comments. And last week we did a live, which I think went really well. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining. Thank you for participating. And we're gonna do a lot more lives coming up. I'm gonna make a whole schedule of lives. But I'm actually going away for a little bit. I'm doing a family vacation. We're gonna go out west and do a little skiing as it's President's Day today. Today is uh, February 20th. So I thought maybe I'll go through the comments and do one more video for when I'm away. I could post this and you know keep everyone up to date. So let me go back um, and cover some of the questions that I did not cover in the live. So here's a question from a Vic Centeno. And this is about three weeks ago. And I think this is where I left off. So he asks, what happens if you died waiting for your case? What should be done? And I guess what he's asking is what happens when a personal injury plaintiff passes away? And I had the same question this weekend from a client of mine. He uh, is a client and he has somebody in his family who's elderly who also has a personal injury case. And he was asking, well, what can we do now? Is there anything we can do like a power of attorney or anything we can do now? And I think, you know, I'm not too familiar with this because this is more of a trusts and estates question, maybe for a trusts and estates or a wills lawyer. But I don't think there's really anything you can do ahead of time. When someone does pass away, what happens is uh, a family member can apply and file for what are known as letters of administration. And then someone else, like say a son, or um, it could be a daughter, it could be you know anyone like a wife or a husband, whoever's the surviving family member could then apply for letters of administration. And once those letters of administration are issued to you by the surrogates court, then with those letters of administration, it's like you have the power, right? You have the authority to then administer the estate. And one of the things in administering the estate is the personal injury lawsuit. So you get to continue the lawsuit. And then at the end of the case, you still have to apply for what's known as a death compromise order to have the, the judge approve the settlement. Kind of similar to infants. When, when an infant gets a settlement, there's an infant compromise order and the judge has to approve it, the amount that the infant's gonna get, it goes into a bank account, it grows at the highest rate of interest, and then when the child becomes 18, they're an adult, they can take the money. And there's some exceptions, you could use the money maybe for college, or you can use the money for the family to buy, or maybe put a down payment on a house, sometimes they'll make exceptions. And it works similarly in a death compromise order, except here, what they're really concerned about is making sure that everybody uh, who, who who's entitled to a share, right? The dis distributees is what they call them. That everyone, like say there's a son and a daughter, right? So each of them gets their distributive share. So that's what they kind of look at and make sure that everybody gets uh, paid according to the wills and trusts law of the particular state. Like here in New York, there's a certain rule. I believe the wife gets 50% or the husband gets 50%, right? If they're legally married at the time of death. So then that, then the, then the our kids get equal shares. Um, so yeah, so, so basically that's how it works. But it's a little bit of a, of a process. It's a little bit. And technically what happens also is if somebody dies, let's say I'm representing somebody, right? They're injured in a car crash. They die. I don't have a client anymore as a lawyer. I have to have the family members, right? They can hire me to continue the case since I've already know the case. I've already been working on it. But they could also hire some other lawyer. Technically, a death is like a moratorium on the entire case, and then all your rights uh, disappear, and so then the family has to hire you. So that, that's usually how it works with death. Okay, let's go to the next question. We have some comments here from Black Powerful says, another great video. Thank you so much. Thank you for supporting us. And then um, Mike Richards says... Um, Oh, okay. I think we covered this question before, perhaps. He's talking about lies or inaccuracies in a deposition. So basically, if somebody's giving a deposition, but they didn't hear or understand the question that the attorney asked, so they answered what they thought they heard, and and he's saying, it, is it important to be completely truthful and honest to the best of one's abilities, and can that hurt you? I mean, yeah, it could. I mean, potentially it could hurt you. What I like to do with depositions is, I like to really spend time 
with my clients before a deposition because a deposition is very important. They're gonna ask the personal injury plaintiff, the victim, a bunch of questions about liability, who's to blame, who's at fault, about damages, how their life has changed, what their treatment is, their medical care. And also they're gonna ask a lot of other things, right? To try to maybe poke holes or to make the case weaker, right? A good lawyer is gonna be really, really specific and do a, and they're gonna jump around, right? To make it a little bit confusing perhaps. So what I like to do is really spend time, maybe like not just one time. A lot of lawyers just say, oh, the morning of, or depositions at 10, the morning of 9.30, call me and we'll prepare. No, I don't think that's good. If it's a big case, if you have a fusion, a brain injury, any kind of big case, a serious injury case that could be worth millions of dollars, I would prepare for it, right? You know when the deposition is. Let's say the deposition is April 15th. Well, between now and April 15th, we have a lot of time. Why don't we do like five preps and each prep will be an hour. And we could space it out. We could do one in February. We could do a few in March. We could do a few in April. And you know, that way you're really ready for it. And, but, but going back to your question, I mean, if there's anything that you don't understand, you can just say, you know what? I don't understand the question. Can you please rephrase it? Or can you please repeat it? That's fine. You know, and, and the other thing that's important is listen to the question. Listen to what the lawyer is asking you. Make sure you understand the question and make sure you're able to answer the question in your mind, right, before you even say a word. Now, having understood what the question is, having understood, you know, what the answer will be, now go ahead and give the answer. So, for example, if they ask you something like, um, uh, you know, how long after the crash did you hire a lawyer? How long did you wait to hire a lawyer? You could say, well, what are they really asking me? They're asking me how long I waited. Okay, when, when did I hire a lawyer? I think I called a lawyer about a week later. So now I understand what the question is. I understand how I'm going to answer it. So then I say, you know what? I think it was approximately a week later. So, you know, you, you give that answer because what you don't want to do is just start talking, right? And it's like stream of consciousness and you don't know where you're going to go. And you're like meandering on a road and then all of a sudden you might say something that you don't want to say. Then they're going to harp on that. <laughs> you see, there's a lot of rabbit holes that these defense lawyers can go down and confuse you and then lead to things that, you know, start to asking you about like, I don't know, something like you dancing at your aunt's wedding in Jamaica in 2017. That you, why are you even talking about that? How did we even get there? It's because of these rabbit holes that you're t you start talking and then you don't know, you know, where you're going to go. So it's very important to... Um, yeah, just listen to the question. But, but also I think what he's asking is if somebody, if somebody says something and it's a little bit inaccurate, you do get the transcript back, you know, the actual transcript of what you said and what the court reporter wrote down. And then you have in New York, you have 60 days to review it and you can fill out an errata sheet. You could say, this was a mistake. I want to correct it. So you could do that as well. And, and then send that back. And now a lot of the uh, depositions are being videotaped. So that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, I like to videotape some of the depositions when I do depositions of defendants, then you can play that in court. If it's a powerful deposition, it could be really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what other questions we did. Here's a question uh, for I am Jay Hunter. I was hit by an 18 wheeler. I had three bulging discs and a concussion from the accident. I got an injection for pain management. The company has 1 million in coverage. I have a lawyer, but watching your videos, I see that having a lawyer with experience with truck cases is important. How do I know if I have the right lawyer? I wanna maximize my settlement. Yeah, I mean, definitely with a truck case, you really wanna get a lawyer that's familiar with trucking. And like, for example, I'm a member of the American Truck Accident Attorneys Group, and they have some of the top attorneys that actually run um, nationwide continuing legal educations and trucking. They actually do like a thing, something in Montana where uh, a truck instructor goes through everything with a tractor trailer, how to drive it. And they, people go out to Montana. I think they're doing it again this year in May or June. And then they, they teach you everything, all the ins and outs of the truck. Also, you have to know like what to request. Like there's a black box that will record like an electronic data recorder known as a black box, just like you have in airplanes. They have that in trucks. So you wanna make sure you get that, but they, they, they don't always like the insurance companies and the trucking companies don't always wanna give that to you. So you might have to make a motion in court. And then with trucking, like I've discussed in other videos, there's a lot of intricacies, right? There's broker and shipper liability. They're, they could have separate policies for the tractor versus the trailer. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of different things. So you definitely want to make sure you have an attorney who is familiar with trucking or who's a specialist in trucking. And, you know, if you wanted to get like a second opinion, if you need to have any questions, just feel free to text me. I'm happy to chat with you about your case. And if you needed like um, a second opinion, I could give you one of the lawyers that I work with uh, who is a member of this Amer American Truck Accident Attorneys Group. And then they could give you like a second opinion um, or just a consultation, depending on where, uh, you know, what city it's in. But I pretty much know lawyers all over the country. We have good ones in Texas, Florida, California. You know, I'm, I'm handling New York, but there's other trucking lawyers in the Northeast that I that I know that are excellent. So yeah, whatever whatever you needed. Um, but but it's kind of hard, like you know, asking how do I know if I have the right lawyer. It's kind of like saying, you know, I'm having surgery tomorrow. How do I know that my doctor is the best doctor to do the surgery? I mean, in reality, you don't, right? You just have to look at their resume, make sure that you trust them when you've met with them, make sure that they have a record that they go to court and they get, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions as verdicts and settlements. Make sure they have a good track record. Make sure you're comfortable with them. How is the communication? Are they calling you back? Are they available? Like if you text them, do they text you back? Like I was texting clients this weekend on Sunday. You know, I try to get back to people. I mean, sometimes, you know, I, I, I can't get back to everyone either. You know, I try to schedule things. But, but, but what I'm saying is like just your level of comfort and your level of uh, ease with your attorney. Because ultimately, they're your attorney. So they're your guide. They are there to guide you through this process of a personal injury lawsuit, which is like, a strange, you know, um, almost like the woods, right? You don't want to go into the woods at night by yourself. And this personal injury process, civil uh, lawsuit is like the woods, like the dark woods. You don't want to go into the dark woods by yourself and you don't know how to get out. So this lawyer is supposed to be your guide who knows how to get out. They have a flashlight. They, they've been there before and they can get you out and they can get you that result. So uh, really, whoever you're comfortable with, that's, that's really the short answer. Okay, let's go to some other questions. What is this question here? Amanda Lynn Gibson, she says, I'm curious if you ever sleep or have you discovered cloning and are there several Arcades? I clearly enjoy learning from you because I listen to you today. And she's thinking about accepting a settlement and not going to trial. And she was commenting on a video how a personal injury lawsuit works yeah, I think I, oh yeah, I think she emailed me and I emailed her back. I said, yeah, text me, please text me um, 347-566-9595. I'm happy to get on a call and really talk to you. I think, yeah, this lady had a serious brain injury and she uh, was upset because an attorney kind of convinced her to take a less of a settlement than she thought that she deserved. So I'm happy to speak to you. I mean, if, you, if, if the paperwork's already been signed, if a release has already been signed, you may not be able to undo it, unfortunately. It's just that I, I think that's very, very hard. But maybe we could, uh, maybe we could help, you know, uh, or, or, or at the very least, we could give you a, um, just a consult and uh, give you some advice and just to answer your questions. So yeah, I'm sorry to hear that you're going through that. But yeah, feel free to text me. And I'm going to reach back out as well. I think she reached out to me when I was on trial. Oh, this was an older one. This was a few weeks ago. Yeah about staying up late. I think that was because maybe I was up watching the Australian Open. I'm a tennis fan too, so was, that's, a, that's in Australia. So you have to stay up late to watch. Maybe I was watching a match and I saw something, so I just responded. Okay, let's see here. What other questions do we have here? Can I sue my boss for a work injury where the, when they fired me, I was working in roofing and I fell off a house and my boss told me I don't have no more with him. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you may be able to. I mean, it really depends. That's more of an employment question, right? Whether you could sue your boss for firing you. So I can maybe connect you with an employment lawyer. I know a few employment lawyers. But um, the work injury, you may be able to sue for the work injury, you know, you can't usually sue your employer if it's an official employee employer relationship and they have workers' comp insurance available for you, then your route would be workers' comp, which would pay for your medical bills and your lost wages. But 
if it's not workers' comp, right? Like, let's say you're working on a big project. It's like a commercial construction. And, you know, your boss is one of the subcontractors and you fall off a roof. Well, now you could sue in New York, at least the general contractor on the job site. If it's not your boss, because that's a third party, you could sue the owner of the construction, which is also not your boss, right? It's the landlord of that commercial construction. And that's a really strong case because that's a labor law case, either a 240 if you fell off a roof because of the lack of safety devices. So then you would get probably summary judgment on liability. And then the only question would be, how much to pay you for all your damages, right? So that could be a huge case. So it just depends on the circumstances. So again, yeah, feel free to text me and I'm happy to speak with you and see if you qualify. It's kind of hard. There's not like a one, one size fits all for all of this because there's a lot of intricacies with, um, with personal injuries. So um, we have to really get into the details. Okay, here's a question. I had to do a neuropsych IME for a TBI case and during the IME, they asked me if I had done illegal drugs. I said that I had taken psilocybin and MDMA a long time ago. Will that be used against me during the trial? And why do they ask questions like that? Well, you know, I think the reason they ask questions like that is remember, they're defendants, right? What are they trying to do? They're trying to protect their money. And how do they protect their money? Well, they're gonna argue that your injury and maybe your brain injury is not from the accident, but it's from anything else, right? What else is there in the whole world? What can we think of? Oh, maybe the fact that you did psilocybin when you were like 18 and now you're like 50, but you know, maybe we could have some kind of tenuous connection back to that. And so it's, I mean, it's nonsensical it really is, but that's what they try to do. So uh, uh, that, that's what they're gonna try to do. So, I mean, a, a good lawyer, if you have a good trial lawyer, they should be able to shut that down and just show that in reality, what they're doing is they're trying to avoid taking ownership of the real issue, right? They're, they're avoiding responsibility, they're avoiding accountability, and they are just trying to, you know, put blame, point the finger, you know, throw things up against the wall and see what sticks kind of thing, which is what defendants often do. But I wouldn't really worry about it. Definitely talk to your lawyer about it and uh, be honest about it, but I wouldn't really worry about it if it happened many, many years ago. Okay, then Ella Daz says, you are quite a savvy attorney and don't think people are not paying attention. You are greatly appreciated. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that's one of our regular subscribers, regular viewers. So we always love to see people coming back and watching. And let's see what other videos, what other questions do we have? Thomas Robichaud says, please do some videos on drop foot from a trip and fall against a third party. Yeah, absolutely. I will do drop foot. I'm gonna do that. I've been researching some of these topics and you know, I've been gathering the, what I do is I go on the databases, like there are a few databases. There's like Westlaw, there's Lexis, there's the Jury Verdict Reporter. There's also sometimes blogs or things you can find online. So I've been gathering some of the cases about different topics like CRIPS, the chronic regional, uh, actually it's complex regional pain syndrome, CRIPS, which is also a form of reflex sympathetic dystrophy, that's one. Then I was doing, of course, like fusions, you know, traumatic brain injury, drop foot is a very serious injury. And I've also done certain types of uh, incidents like trucking accidents, ceiling collapses, you know. And then what I'll do is I'll put them in folders and, and they'll have all the cases in there. And then I have to go through and read some of the cases. Sometimes there's like hundreds of cases and then really kind of like marshal the evidence and um, summarize it and then see what's interesting and then pick the interesting ones and and then make videos about it maybe make a little outline so it might take a little time but i'm going to start doing more of those absolutely those are great okay let's see what other questions people have here here's a question from a carlos rodriguez the potential value of a worker's comp case. I'm a 30 year old nurse's aide in a mental department of New York Presbyterian Hospital. And I sustained an injury that resulted in treatments such as injections, a lumbar fusion, lumbar dis discectomy. The incident occurred three years ago and I have not been able to work since then. Recently, I just completed an L5S1 lumbar fusion a few months ago. I've been living off of workers' comp since the incident, and I would appreciate an estimate of the potential value. Yeah, I mean, that could be a really serious case. Now, if it's pure workers' comp, meaning pure workers' comp, 
you'd probably be getting those um, you know, bi-weekly payments to reimburse you for your lost wages, as well as perhaps all your medical bills will be covered, right? So workers' comp will pay for like the fusion and all your other medical bills. So you won't have to pay for that. Then if you wanna stop getting those bi-weekly payments, you could do something known as a section 32 settlement. And the amount will really depend on um, your lawyer and all of the medical evidence, as well as the carrier, right? The workers' comp carrier, that's the insurance company that pays out the benefit, their lawyer, and then you go before the administrative judge and then everything gets uh, resolved there in a, a, in a workers' comp trial or a workers' comp hearing. I'm not too familiar with the you know, straight workers' comp. I usually do the third-party lawsuits. So I couldn't tell you exactly, but I mean, it sounds like it could be really, really serious. It should be at least you know, a few hundred thousand, maybe even, I don't know if they do settlements for into the millions, but, but I'm pretty sure the way it works is whatever the amount is, you get that lump sum, right? And then you do like a spend down and then you get like credit. So once the money is spent, then if the injury is still there, you could go back on get to getting those uh, biweekly payments, the smaller payments. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's how it works. So, but yeah, definitely speak to your workers comp lawyer about that. That, that could be, that could, that's definitely a serious case. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Here's a comment about a question, uh, a, a video about best insurance companies. And then Ray asks, did you go to mediation or arbitration or court for that million dollar result for a TBI? Oh, that one, yeah, no, that one actually, we didn't do anything. We didn't go to a mediation, we didn't do an arbitration and we didn't go to court. I mean, we, we did file a lawsuit, it was in court. And what I did was I sent them a letter and it was one of those settlement opportunity letters. I said, look, this case is clearly a serious traumatic brain injury. Pay us a million dollars because we see that that's all you have. It was a car that hit my client as a pedestrian and my client had a serious traumatic brain injury with subdural hematoma as well as subdural hemorrhage. She had like bleeding inside the brain and really serious life-changing injury. She was an older woman here in Brooklyn. She was, I think, in her 60s. So I said, look, you, clearly it's worth the million. Pay me the million. And the adjuster writes back, and this was like the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. She goes, well, how do we know that it's really serious? You know, maybe she'll get better. Meanwhile, you know, she's got like bleeding in the brain. She was admitted to the hospital for like weeks and weeks. And now she's back home, but she could never work again. She was working, you know, actively. Um, she could never work again. And she just like doesn't remember things. Like, for example, she'll turn on the, you know, the stove to cook something. And all of a sudden she'll forget that the stove is on. And so she can't watch the, the grandkids anymore because that's dangerous, right? So now they have to get somebody to watch her. And before she was watching, the grandkids and the parents would go off to work. So, I'm, I, you know, so it really changed the, the entire life. And this adjuster was saying something ridiculous, like, how do we know it's not just going to go away on its own? So I basically just kept sending them letters or emails. And I just said, look, whatever you guys want to do, you have 30 days. It's clearly worth the million. That's all the insurance you have. So pay me that million. If you don't pay me the million, then we'll go to court. But guess what? If I go to court and I'm forced to prepare this case and hire my own experts like a traumatic brain injury, neuroradiologist, neuropsychologist, neurologist, as well as you know uh, economic experts, I'm not going to go to court and ask for a million. I'm going to go to court and probably tell the jury that civil justice in this case is 10 million. And then if I get that 10 million verdict or anything over a million, if I get five or whatever, anything more than a million, what are you gonna do? Who's gonna pay it? Isn't it gonna be your insured who's just an individual driving that car? Don't you have a duty to protect that policyholder as an insurance company? You have to put your financial interests on an equal footing with your policyholder's interests. You can't leave your policyholder out to dry and let them get hit for $10 million and be like, oh, sorry, so sorry, you got hit for $10 million. It's because we're, we just wanted to save our money. You can't do that, you know? So then they got really, really scared and they just said, okay, take the million. And so we took the million, uh, but, but that's usually, you know, that's usually a standard thing that, uh, that happens in these cases. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. I was a passenger in an Uber and got rear-ended. I have a herniated disc and lateral meniscus. What's a rough estimate? Well, you know, it's hard to say. I need to know where it is. I need to really speak with you. Um, I couldn't really, that, that's too much of a guess. But usually uh, a herniated disc can be worth 
a substantial amount, even by itself without surgery. A, a torn meniscus, depending on if you have surgery, like an arthroscopic surgery, I would say is worth like anywhere from 100,000 to three, even two, 300,000. We even had one case go for like 650 on a, a torn meniscus with surgery. And so a rough estimate. The good thing is that Uber does not have any, um, oh, I see he's a passenger in an Uber. Okay, so he got rear-ended. So we would need to know how much the defendant has then. If you're the passenger in the Uber and you got rear-ended, the Uber policy doesn't matter. I was gonna say Uber usually has a million in coverage, but you know that's if Uber was at fault. So you'd have to look to see how much they, that car that did the rear-ending, who was to blame, how much they have in insurance. So yeah, so that that would be. So I would, yeah, you could always feel free to text me the three four seven five six six nine five nine five. Happy to do a call. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Jeffrey Mello says hello. I got an ACDF two level surgery and I need a lumbar fusion and a left ankle and left knee surgery. I am based out of New York as well. I have switched my attorney five times. I realized the a holes. I don't want to say what he wrote, but I were I was employing were trying to rob me of my second case. So they fired counsel and forced me to sign up with another set of crooks. I'm not really sure what he means, but I just peace. My wife divorced me, told me I was a drug addict. And one day I went to work and got back and she was gone. Oh my God, I'm so sorry to hear that. So this is obviously a life-changing injury that this person suffered, lost his wife. And, and he feels like these attorneys that he had were, were trying to rob him. So, you know, I can't really give too much advice just based on that, but it sounds like he has a serious you know, case. He's got like a two-level surgery, lumbar fusion, uh, ankle and knee surgery. Yeah, feel free to just text me, reach out, and um, happy to speak with you, give you a consultation. Maybe I can help. You know, maybe I can't. Maybe it's too far along if you have all these attorneys and maybe the case is almost done. So you don't really need my me to step in and, and help as a lawyer, maybe you just need a consultation and we can just chat about it, but I'm happy to, you know, give you my, uh, listen to you, you know, give you my ear and help you in any way I can, but I'm so sorry to hear that that happened. But it sounds like uh, it could definitely be a multi-million dollar case. Okay. Oh, and then he says, I want to switch to you. If you have a set of big balls, I'll like to hire you. Okay, yeah, I guess that's that's a good reason to hire a lawyer, yeah. I mean, not necessarily like big balls in the sense that, oh, I'm so, you know, strong, but really the sense of being fearless, being willing to go before a jury and um, being willing to take a verdict. I, you know, that, that is a, an important characteristic because a lot of lawyers are leaving so much money on the table because they are afraid, right? They're, they think like, well, look, it's a million dollar offer. So I got to take it or it's a $500,000 offer. I should just take it. But wait a minute, this case is not a $500,000 case. This is a $5 million case. So what are you doing taking $500,000? Go to court and get more. But to go to court, you know, you have to dot your I's and cross your T's. You have to make sure all your subpoenas are out. You have to, you know, make sure you spend the money on experts. You, you know, there's a lot of prep work. There's a lot of little nooks and crannies that you have to take care of. It's not easy, but you know, it's like going to war, but are you willing to go to war? And I think like some people are like, I, I definitely am. I just finished a trial, um, you know, about two weeks ago now, and I'm actually missing it. I want to go back. I want to go back in the trenches. I love, I love being on trial. It's just so much fun. But, you know, we, and I learned a lot from that trial. We did well, I thought, you know, we were happy. The client was crying tears of joy because she was so happy with the result. But, you know, I learned a lot. There were certain things that I could have done better. So I, I always take that, I learn from that, and then next time I'm gonna use that. So I'm always learning, whether I'm learning from myself, learning from my own mistakes, learning from other people, like continue, continuing legal educations. Um, like actually later today, I'm supposed to do a, a workshop with a group and they're gonna show how they build up a case the right way. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm always, I'm always learning, that's what, that's what it's all about. But yeah, if you wanna switch, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if I could take it, uh, but I'd be happy to speak with you. Just give me a call and uh, yeah, I'm going to actually put it, put it, put it right here. Um, put my number in here. So he, um, he's able, um, he's able to reach out or maybe we could help him. That's great. I mean, yeah, it's the same gentleman who he sort of lost his wife and um, that's terrible. I'm sorry to hear that. Okay. Let's see what other questions we have. 
trying to move through. Oh, we're at the almost a 30 minute mark. We don't want to make these videos too long. So let's see if we can move through. And um, Ra GTM says, I had gotten hit by a triple A truck while they were towing a customer in New York City. I have back issues, a lot of physical therapy, had a shoulder surgery to drain fluid. How much is it worth? And then he said I had to do more surgeries, but I got hit 50K insurance cap and they refused to pay out of pocket. I mean, a shoulder surgery from a truck accident like that can definitely be worth like half a million or more. Um, like recently we settled one for 650, like I was saying earlier. Um, but it really depends. Every case is different. It depends on the venue, it depends on, you know, depends on you, like how, how you present and how you testify. So I'd have to see like also what stage it's at. Is it just getting started? Is it a recent case? Have you already been deposed? And maybe it's already on the trial calendar and trial is already set for like May. Then maybe it's too late to do anything. You, you should just stick with the current lawyer and let them see it through. So, but I'm happy to do a consult. Just the best thing to do is just to reach out. But that sounds like a very, very serious, potentially multi-million dollar case even. Okay. Let's see what other questions we have here. Oh, here's a quick question. Circumnavigate says, what do you recommend a plaintiff to do to prepare for trial? Yeah, what I would re recommend is definitely go over your deposition testimony because you've already testified, right? So they have that transcript. Read that over, go over the deposition testimony, make sure that you understand it, make sure if there's anything that you said that you're not happy with, how you're going to deal with that at trial. Because in cross-examination, the defense lawyer can can ask you about that again and say, isn't it true that you said blah, 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 blah. So then how are you going to deal with it? And you don't have to decide how to deal with it on your own, right? That's something you can do during prep with your attorney. And so that's one way to, to really prepare. And then just be, you know, just relax, be yourself. Uh, definitely don't argue with the defense lawyer because what they're, what they're trying to do by cross-examining you is they're trying to you know, score points and show like, oh, maybe you are over exaggerating. Maybe you are a malingerer. Maybe you are a fraudster of some sort to get the jury to to decide because ultimately it's about the jury, right? The jury gets that questionnaire. Was the defendant negligent? Yes or no. And then what is the amount that we should put for the plaintiff's pain and suffering? Now, if they think you're not credible, if they think that credibility is an issue, they can give you less, right? But if they think that you're honest, that you're being vulnerable, that you're being truthful, that you really have this life-changing forever injury and you've told your true human story, then they say, look, this is this is something that happened to this poor individual. This is a real serious injury victim. We have to compensate him, right? Because what if it happened to one of us? What if it happened to one of my friends? What if it happened to me? You know, you're not supposed to say that outright. That's like a golden rule violation. But everyone's kind of thinking it. That's the elephant in the room, right? That's what everyone's thinking on the jury. And then as a group, right? In New York, we have six people. They all talk to each other. They all make a group decision. In other states, it could be even 12 people. But how is that group dynamic? How are they going to decide that? So I think the best way is just, you know, be yourself. And if they start trying to like hammer you on something trivial, some minutia, you know, better to just admit it. Be like, yeah. It's true. I didn't go to the doctor for a week as opposed to fighting them and being like, oh, uh, what do you mean? I didn't go to the doctor. I tried to go. I got in the car, but then the car broke down. And then it's like, wait a minute. Why are you arguing? If you're arguing so much and you're fighting with that lawyer so much, then it makes you look bad a lot of the time. So sometimes it's better to just admit things, especially if they're not uh, that central to your case, not that important. But there's a whole there's a whole philosophy of uh, you know how to deal with um, cross examination, how to deal with direct examination, and how to be a good witness. It's probably it's a whole um, it takes time. You know, some people are just good witnesses, natural witnesses. Uh, some people may be a little bit um, harder for them to be a good witness for whatever reason. Maybe they're nervous. Maybe they um, just don't come across as credible. So. But, but yeah, to, and, and to answer your question, to prepare, I think that's probably the best way to prepare. Just like practice, 
prepare with your lawyer, read through your deposition, and work on just um, work on those vulnerabilities, work on those problems. Like think to yourself, like if I lose this case, why would I lose? What are the defense points, right? What it, what what will be if I was defending this case? If I was the defense lawyer, what would I argue, right? And just write it down, make like a checklist, and go through it and be like, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to deal with that? How am I going to deal with this? I think that's the best way to do it, right? Because think about it, if you're playing chess, what is the other person's move? So it's the same kind of thing. But with these cases, you see the same defenses over and over again. They're going to either say that, you know, we didn't cause it, or they're going to say that if we did cause it, that it wasn't so bad, or if it was really bad, then something else. You know, they're always going to come up with the standard um, defenses that they always use. So it's not usually that hard. And a good trial attorney should, should know all these by, you know, by heart. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's not too bad. Okay, let's do maybe like one more question. And, um, and then I guess we'll be done because we're at the 35 minute mark. Let's see. Nana So Crazy asks, what happens if a rental truck hits a pedestrian in a crosswalk? Who's responsible? The driver? Question mark. The company who rented the truck? Question mark. Or the rental company? Question mark. Well, I mean, if a rental truck hits a pedestrian, so definitely the owner, the owner operators are always responsible. So the operator of the truck and the owner of the truck. The rental company might be the owner of the truck, so in, in which case they could be responsible too. The company that rented the truck could be responsible as well, actually, because say, for example, like, you know, if I go out and I rent a truck like at U-Haul, but then I have a business and I'm renting the truck in order to, like, say, bring party supplies. If I'm throwing a party for someone, like a birthday party, and I have all these party supplies, or cakes, whatever, and I'm transporting it, it's my company that's doing it, right? I'm in the course and scope of my employment. If I then crash into somebody, my company could be on, on the hook too. So what I would do is just get a good lawyer and sue everyone involved. And then, um, but yeah, usually the owner operator are the ones that are responsible and usually they'll have the insurance on the, um, on the truck. But a renter could have additional insurance, especially if it's a commercial renter, right? So, okay, I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much for watching our channel. Thank you for commenting and asking questions because like you see, it gives us a lot of information that we could then take your questions and answer them and create these kinds of videos. So thanks for watching this episode of Last Week Tonight. Please like and subscribe to our channel. If you've chatted with us, if we've given you any kind of helpful guidance, maybe a consult call, please leave us feedback. I think we have links in the description where you can go and leave us feedback, maybe a review because we have a few offices here in New York City. We have uh, two in Brooklyn, we have Queens, we have two in Manhattan, we have the Bronx. So the more positive feedback we get, I think the more people are likely to see us and find us. And we thank you for that. And just like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what topics you want to see in the future and keep your questions coming so we could do more last week tonight episodes. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great week and we will speak to you very soon. Okay, bye-bye everyone. <laughs>